Okay, so okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work. So I'm Baptiste Suya, I'm a PhD student in Brussels, and uh, today for the first time I will present uh, my work on the effect of our executive experience on the location decisions of multinational firms. Okay, so just to uh, um, present you a little bit what motivated this project, uh, at the beginning of this project, there, there is a very large question, which is what determines foreign direct investments? Okay, what determines foreign uh, FDIs? What makes firms for uh, invest in foreign countries? And uh, of course, I mean, this question is very large. Okay, it's uh, definitely not a new question. Uh, but this is a question which is very important for policymakers, for example. I mean, countries that have long been competing to attract uh, uh, FDI's inflows, okay, by virtue of, of uh, uh, their positive effect on economic development, growth, et cetera. So unsurprisingly, we, if you go into the literature, you will see that there are a lot of papers on the determinants of FDI's, okay. So you, Many factors have been emphasized. Okay, you can think of technology, size, uh, institutions of countries, firm connectivity, firm size, etc. A lot of papers on that. And in parallel, you have another literature um, in economics. Basically, we see more and more papers, and in recent years, that try to document the effect of uh, on firm performance, okay, and in particular on firm performance in international markets. So the thing is that you have these two literatures, but um, in the middle, okay, in between, you don't have a lot of research uh, about the question, and it's a bit unfortunate because, I don't know, if you read some newspapers or you look at uh, press releases, etc., you can see, I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence showing that executives, for example, have a very important role when it comes to uh, uh, activities of firms uh, at the international level, okay? But so you have a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence, but systematic evidence on the contrary is relatively scarce, all right? So what I do, uh, or what I try to do in this paper somehow is to try to flip this gap, okay? And what I will do is that I will focus on one very specific characteristic of uh, um, executives which is their experience in managing multinational operations. Okay, so as you will see, I will construct a very rich database on subsidiaries of all firms listed on the S&P, okay? So for all track the subsidiaries across countries and over time, okay? And I will be able to do the same for executives, okay? So basically I will be able to uh, uh, track executives across these firms and over time, okay? So at the end of the day, I will have a very large and rich database. And uh, what I will do is that I, with a very simple event study and defensive approach, I will try to quantify the effect of recruiting an executive which is familiar with a specific country, okay? On the probability to have subsidiaries in this country, okay? And by familiar with the country, I mean having worked for a firm in the past, which itself had some subsidiaries in this specific country, okay? And if you wanna have a preview of the results, uh, basically what I do find in this paper is a positive effect of executive experience on firm present services. And if you wanna have a, a, um, some ideas about the order of magnitude, what I will show you is that recruiting an executive which is familiar with a, a foreign country C, augments the probability that the firm enter this country C by around 7%. Okay, so the effect is quite sizable. And uh, as the presentation goes on, I will try to convince you that uh, the effect is robust, okay? That uh, uh, the effect is really there. And more importantly, that the effect is causal. Okay, so I will try to convince you of this causality in multiple ways, okay? I will. Come back to this uh, later in this presentation, and if time permits, I will also show you the results. So basically, I will show you that only country-specific experience is important. So, for example, recruiting um, an executive who is familiar with Spain won't help the firm uh, set up new subsidiaries, let's say in Italy. 
Okay, so this is something which has to be very country specific. Also, what I will show you is that the effect is quite heterogeneous uh, across executives. So actually, the effect is very large for CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, and COs. But for the other executives, the effect is uh, is very low or even uh, uh, equal to zero actually. Then I will uh, maybe show you as well that the effect persists at the intensive margin. Okay, so recruiting. Uh, experienced um, executive allow firms to reach new countries, but also to intensify their presence in the countries where they are already implanted. And uh, to rest results, I will show you that um, actually uh, experience in managing multinational operations is uh, an asset that is valuable on the labor market. Okay, this entails a watch premium. And uh, what I will try, uh, show you is that the effect is already is also there for tax havens, and this is uh, I mean this has very cool implications. Why? Because what it tells you is that uh, 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 profit shifting activities of multinational firms spread across these multinational firms also via executive mobility. Okay, and uh, one of one policy implication that you can think of is that public authorities uh, uh, to curb profit shifting activities on multinational firms could, for example, track uh, executives, the top guys uh, uh, across multinational companies, okay, to better predict the use, the future use of tax events. Okay. So at the end of the day, I think that uh, the paper contributes to different strands of the literature, okay, uh, to four strands, uh, actually. So as I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, there is this very large literature on FDI, okay, the determinants of FDI. But the thing is that uh, in this uh, literature, most of the determinants are firm-specific or country-specific. And what I do in this paper, actually, is that I uh, uh, open the black box uh, of the firm, okay, I analyze the effect of their executives, and uh, uh, I show that the experience of executives is uh, uh, important to understand uh, uh, location decisions of multinational firms. Okay. Then you have also this literature on management and film performance in the international market. I was mentioning uh, at the beginning of the presentation as well. Okay, so you have a lot uh, more and more papers about that. Very recent one. But the thing is that in this literature, um, the paper focus on exports and imports. Okay, so here with uh, what I do in this paper is that actually I look at uh, another aspect of firm performance in international market, which is FDIs. All right. Then you have also literature that uh, try to you know investigate the differences uh, um, in wages and in compensations across workers. Okay, and with the paper, actually, I show that experience uh, of executives in terms of management of multinational operations is uh, a valuable asset. Okay, so it helps somehow understand differences uh, in compensations across executives. And then you have also this whole literature about the determinants of corporate tax avoidance profit shifting. And basically, what I show in, the, in this paper is that executives they develop knowledge in profit shifting, okay, while they work for multinational firms, and they tend to replicate uh, the profit shifting behavior of the firms they were previously working for in their new firms, okay. So these uh, tax avoidance uh, strategies spill over multinational firms via executive mobility, okay. So in this presentation, I will proceed as follows. So first, I will introduce you the data. Then I will show you the very benchmark results, and then I will, you know, uh, show you plenty of uh, robustness checks. If time permits, I will show you also uh, uh, one of, I mean, some of the results that I have mentioned earlier, and then I will conclude. Okay. So if you guys at any point have uh, any question, please don't hesitate. Okay. So the data. So the data that I use um, for this paper, they, can, they come from three sources, okay? CompuStat, ExecuComp, and Exhibit21. So CompuStat uh, is a very large database, which is uh, quite well known uh, in some strand of the literature, in IO, international trade, etc. Why? Because it's a very rich database that contains financial statements, uh, information of all publicly listed firms in North America, since the 50s, okay? So you have a pretty, pretty large database 
uh, um, uh, that is used yeah, in multiple strands of the literature. And basically what I do uh, for this paper is that I only keep two variables that are actually uh, unique identifiers, okay? Why I don't exploit the other information? Because as you will see later on, all uh, firm characteristics will be accounted for in the econometric exercise with fixed effect, okay? So I don't have uh, to, to, to pick up this information. And actually these two identifiers will allow me to connect the two other databases on executives and on subsidiaries. Okay, so this is the core database, let's say. So I have CompuStat, and then I have a, a execute comp. Okay, so execute comp is, um, in very simple words, a database which consists of uh, a lot of information actually about executives of firms listed in the SP. Okay, so you have, for example, uh, uh, information about the compensation, the title, okay, what, so what they're doing, basically, if they are CEO, CFO, or other any function. Okay, and um, a very important thing to notice is that actually these firms are the largest in the US. Okay, so they are not only publicly listed, okay, but overall, uh, this group of firms uh, represent more, uh, I mean, around 90% of US market capitalization. Okay, so the firms that I have in my database are like the largest ones. Okay, so with this simple data set, basically, I'm able to track executives across this very particular uh, group of firms. Okay, over time. And then the final database uh, is about the subsidiaries. Okay, so basically all firms uh, that are listed in the US are required to uh, disclose, to reveal a list of what we call their significant subsidiaries. Okay, so they, they have to do that every year. I won't go into the accounting details, but uh, uh, actually by uh, significant subsidiaries, you have almost all of them. Okay. So they have to disclose these subsidiaries every year. And a very good thing is that actually, um, the, so they, 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 they fill the document uh, uh, electronically, okay? And this document, these reports, they are publicly available on the website of the SEC, okay? So this is an information that is, I mean, we can uh, have access to, okay? And that we can exploit. Uh, for our studies, okay? So what I do is that actually I uh, use um, an extended version of a database that has already been compiled in another paper, okay? Um, and I cover the 1993 to 2014 period, okay? So with the database, basically I'm able to construct sort of a map of the network of subsidiaries of all firms listed in the SNP, okay? So this is, for example, a snapshot uh, of a report that you can see online, okay? And you can see that you have the list of subsidiaries within the US, okay, by state, but also uh, uh, the list of subsidiaries in the foreign countries, okay? So at the end of the day, I end up with around 2,000 firms, okay, operating between 1993 and 2014. Uh, I know how many subsidiaries they have in more than 200, foreign countries, okay, but I will focus here in this paper on 30 foreign countries. Why only 30 foreign countries? Because I don't have to exploit information on 200 countries, okay? And actually it helps me to have a reasonable database. I mean, in terms of size, uh, it allows to reduce the dimensionality of the database. And uh, so basically the 30 foreign countries are the top locations of subsidiaries of these US firms, okay, abroad. But I will show you that actually the selection that I make on these 30 uh, foreign countries, they don't drive the results, okay? You can randomly pick 30 countries and actually all the results will be preserved, okay? So this selection does not drive any of the results. So I have around 2,000 firms and I have also around 3,000 executives in my database. And for the same reason, to reduce the dimensionality of the database, I focus only on executives that basically work for at least two of these firms, okay, over the entire types line. And why, I mean, um, why do I uh, remove uh, the executives that stay in the same firm over the time span? Because as you will see in a minute in the econometric analysis, actually, I will be able through a battery of fixed effect to control for most of the characteristics, okay? So their omission is not prejudicial. 
Okay. So yeah, 2,000 uh, 2, firms, 3,000 executives, and I have a database at the firm country year level. Okay. So is there any question about the data or can I go on? Yes, yeah. if, anyone has, if anyone has a first data related question or framework related question, now's a great time to start it before we go into any of the results. Um, so anyone um, is? Yeah, yeah. but this, I would have a, a question for you. Um, so, so you said that you have information on um, kind of the most significant subsidiaries. Uh, yeah. how, how detailed is the geography of, of these subsidiaries? Do you have their address or just kind of their state or? Um, so it depends on how. So basically to be considered as a significant subsidiary first, you are, um, your income or your asset should represent at least 10% of the consolidated uh, um, of the consolidated uh, income and assets of the firm, okay? Mm -hmm. But the thing is that um, if you uh, uh, take all the undisclosed subsidiaries, okay, the non-significant subsidiaries, but overall, they represent more than 10% of assets and consolidated income, then they have to be disclosed. So in other words, um, I have information on subsidiaries that cover minimum 90% of consolidated income and assets. So I have almost all uh, subsidiaries. I mean, I miss some subsidiaries, I mean, very, but the very tiny one. So we shouldn't be very, I mean, I cannot do much about that actually. And, and, and for the address, and, um, it depends actually. Um, but in general, you don't have the full address. Just the, the city then, or the... Uh, so basically for the, U, um, for the US, I think for the US you may have the city, yeah. But for a foreign country, no. I have to check, I have to mm -hmm. check. But um, the city, at the, for the foreign uh, subsidiaries, I'm not sure. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Thank you, Betis. There's, we can yeah. add, uh, does anyone else have a follow-up question for, uh, uh, for right now? Uh, yeah, I got one. Is, is the the executive experience, is that something you get from your executive data or is that identified as having worked at a firm that has a subsidiary and country and? Second, uh, second case actually. So this is okay. not something I have in the database, it's something I construct myself by mixing and, the two. And do you observe that during the, like the 93 to 2014 observation window or are you considering before that as well? Good question, actually. Uh, so the answer is no. Uh, basically, so because I construct this variable and I don't have any uh, observation before 1993, then I have to assume I have to assume that they don't have any experience. But I will I, I will address this uh, uh, in a few minutes, actually, where basically I will leave uh, a, a ten year window uh, to allow executives to move across firms and to acquire experience somehow. But yeah, I mean, by construction, yeah, I have to make this assumption that before, I mean, in 1993, no executive had a prior experience. Makes yeah. sense. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Great. And now's probably a good time to press along and there'll be time for questions again as we move forward. Okay. So this is it for the data. So now, um, more concrete, uh, more concretely, what I do to assess, I mean, to, to, to quantify the effect of executive experience uh, uh, on uh, uh, FDI is that I regress the, the, the very simple equation that you can see on the slide here. So it's a very simple linear probability model, okay, where the left-hand side variable is a dummy variable, which is equal to one, if firm I has at least one subsidiary in country C and your chief. Okay, so simple uh, dummy variable. I'm simply looking at the extensive margin here. Okay, so this is it for the dependent variable. Now, uh, the variable of interest actually is this variable that you can see here, treat ICT, which basically represents the number of um, executives in firm I and EFT familiar with country C. Okay. So this is a convariable and actually uh, uh, um, uh, the coefficient of the interest of course will be my uh, alpha there. And the alpha will tell me something about uh, uh, the increase or the decrease in the probability uh, when uh, the probability to enter 
I mean, to be present in country C when I recruit an executive who is uh, experienced with country C. Okay, and of course, because I want to mitigate endogeneity issues, and I will come back to that later on in this presentation, I, uh, I include also a lot of uh, fixed effects. Okay, I have firm fixed effect, country year fixed effect, and firm country fixed effect. So for example, here you will have all uh, firm year specific determinants of FDI. You can think of productivity, you can think of size, uh, and all basically the uh, information that I could have had and in the CompuStat database, and in the financial statements, basically all the potential determinants are in there. Okay. Same for the uh, country year fixed effect. Okay. So basically, you can think of labor costs. You can think of uh, I don't know, tariffs, tax rates, regulations, institutions. Actually, all these variables will be captured in this fixed effect. And finally, you can have also firm country fixed effect, okay, to observe some systematic uh, heterogeneities uh, um, that are firm country specific. And a very important thing to notice here is that actually with this fixed effect, I also capture a lot of characteristics of executives themselves. Okay, so for example, if you think of the age and the education of executives, they will be included in the firm year fixed effect mechanically. Okay, and, uh, and for example, even for uh, executives staying in the same firm over the entire time span, okay, this uh, fixed effect here will also be able to capture their uh, uh, experience with country C. Okay, so basically with this three-way fixed effect, I capture for a lot of things, not all of, uh, all of it, okay, and I will come back to this later on in this presentation, but it allows me to capture for a lot of variables and all the determinants that have been uh, emphasized in the literature, uh, the determinants of FDIs, okay? So this is the benchmark regression, and basically I uh, report the, the, the regression results in this table, okay, where and basically you can see that the coefficient is positive, okay, highly significant, and what it tells you is that actually recruiting an executive who is familiar with the country C increases the probability, the average probability to, uh, to uh, be present in country C by 1.5 percentage points. In other words, recruiting an experienced executive allows the firm, uh, uh, I mean, increases the average probability of the firm to enter country C by around 7%. Okay, and this is what this coefficient tells you. So the effect is quite sizable, all right? So now, can I, we have yeah. a question, can I relate to you? Uh, yeah. Coming from yeah, the yeah, chat, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. we have two kind of related questions from Ernest. One is, is there any time lag on the X's? So I'm imagining that's the treatment variable of number of, um, number of um, executives. And the second question is, can the dependent variable switch after being one, meaning that there is FDI in that country, firm, time, pairing, uh, can it go from one to zero? So can you exit a country? Um, data set? Okay, so two questions to answer. Uh, for the lags, I will come back to that in like three slides, okay? So basically I will show you something about the dynamics of the effect. So I think you will have your, your answer. And for the second question, uh, Actually, yeah. Uh, so basically, if uh, a firm is leave a country, uh, I mean, if it's present in a country and then leave the country and we'll have a one and then a zero. But the thing is that in practice, it's relatively rare. Okay, this case is, uh, I don't have the numbers. Maybe I, I, could, I, mean, I could show some uh, uh, descriptive statistics, but it's relatively rare than, uh, that firms leave a country uh, uh, in a database. Okay, and given everything that you are answering my questions, is the dependent variable somehow um, transformed, like like uh, taking into account this, the size of the executive board? Like, does it matter whether is the, it is uh, you're talking about the big firms or small firms in terms of the board? Because you, uh, if I if I remember well, you mentioned that there is the number of executives with experience in a given country, right? This is the yeah. So does it matter? So why don't the why not the, the share of executives in uh, in that country or something like that? Ah, uh, um, 
Could be. Uh, to be honest, I didn't think about that. Um, but if you're wondering if somehow I control for the size of the board, I do uh, implicitly with the firm uh, year fixed effect actually, because it's a, I mean it's a yeah it's a characteristic that is firm year specific. So I mean I'm implicitly mechanically controlling for that. But uh, it's a good point. I didn't think about uh, using the share of executives. I mean, of experienced executives uh, in a in the board as a, the key variable. So yeah, I will think a, a bit more about that. Thanks. And this is a little bit related to the the topic of like this in fixed effects intensive kind of model. Is your R squared, of course, is going to be supported by those large number of fixed effects? Do you have a sense on what your R squared within regression uh, within panel looks like? Um, nope. No, I no, I cannot. Uh, no, I cannot tell you. Uh, I mean that. Yeah, I cannot tell you that for sure. So I, I just prefer not to to say anything wrong or. Yeah, no, okay. I didn't I, check, but I will. I will. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, Are there any other question or? No. Okay, so I guess I will go on. So uh, this was the benchmark results. Okay, so now, uh, of course, I will show you plenty of robustness checks. Okay, so first, uh, what I mean, very simple robustness check first. Huh? So basically, what you can do is to remove one country at a time, just to make sure that the results are not driven by one country. Surprise, surprise, this is not the case. Okay, um, then uh, what you can do instead of uh, choosing the uh, 30 top locations of foreign subsidiaries, I can select 30 foreign countries randomly, okay? Because as I said, I have a very large database with 200 foreign countries, okay? And uh, I can just select randomly uh, some foreign countries. The results are still there, okay? Then I can basically, um, and this relates to the question that I had earlier, use the 2003-2014 uh, period exclusively for the question for the exact same reason uh, that was uh, mentioned which is that basically because I don't have any information about uh, firm subsidiaries before 1993, I cannot see anything about the experience of executives uh, before that period. Okay, so by construction, I have to assume that before 1993, executives have no experience at all. So what I can do is that basically I can leave, uh, I can leave a 10 year window, okay, during which executives move across firms and acquire somehow experience, okay? And basically, I mean, the results are, are still there, okay? There. And um, other tests that you can do is basically raising me the equations using logit and probit, okay? Basically, the benchmark results are obtained with the linear probability model. There is no consistent literature uh, um, on the optimal estimator that we should use uh, if the dependent variable is a binary variable. Okay, you have a lot of debates uh, uh, and uh, matches, I mean, between linear probability model, log that probit. So basically, what I do is that, I mean, even uh, estimating uh, the equation using log it and probit, the results are very consistent. Okay. And uh, uh, something important to note is that actually when you use um, these models with many fixed effects, okay, in, in my case, I have three way fixed effect, then you have the uh, incidental parameter problems, okay, so your coefficients are biased, they have to be corrected. And basically to deal with that, I, uh, I, I build upon the, the econometric literature, okay, in the paper of insect authors. Anyway. I mean, whether the model is estimated using log it, probit, or OLS, the effect is still there. So this is for the first round of uh, robustness checks. Then I think that you can have, I mean, uh, uh, more serious concerns, and in particular concerns about endogeneity. Okay, so as I said, I have a lot of fixed effect. Okay, they control for a lot of things, but still, still my treatment variable, which is an ICT variable, could still be correlated with uh, an observed shocks, okay, firm country year shocks, and for example, investments. So for example, in general, think of a firm, what they do is that they want to select very strategically their executives, okay? So they take time, okay, it's uh, uh, appointments that are very important for the firms, okay? And for example, if you're a firm and say you wanna uh, reach Spain, and in fact, you hire uh, uh, an executive 
who is experienced with Spain, you are likely to make other investments to uh, reach Spain. Okay, so for example, you can have expenditures in marketing, etc., in order to help you reach Spain. Okay. And the problem is that actually these investments that I do not observe, they could be very clearly correlated with my treatment variable. Okay, and I don't want to capture the effect of this investment. What I really want to capture is the effect of executive experience. So I have a, a very important correlation problem here. And what I will do actually uh, uh, to address these issues is uh, that I will perform four tests. A placebo test, and then I will say something about the dynamics of the effect. Okay, it will relate to a question that I had earlier. I will use IV. Okay, and then I will uh, propose you to um, I think more original, uh, original identification strategies, okay, to show you that the effect is causal, okay, and that the correlation between the error term and my treatment variable should not drive the results that I have presented you so far, okay. So first test uh, is a placebo test, okay. So you may wonder why a placebo test, and the reason is very simple. Uh, as you have noticed, I have a different equation and a very important hypothesis that you make to believe in your uh, difference in difference estimation is that you have to assume common trends. Okay, you have to assume that there is no pre-existing trends uh, um, in uh, your dependent variable. And, um, and this is basically what I do in this graph here. So in this graph, I investigate the dynamics of the effect. Okay, so the recruitment of the experiment executive occurs in year T, okay. And uh, you have actually the variation of the probability to be present in country C in the y axis. And basically, you can see that the, when the, uh, the firm recruits in T, the probability increases okay, significantly, and the effect grows over time. Okay, so the effect is progressive. But more importantly, what you can see is that um, the probability does not move before the recruitment. Before the appointment, you don't have any significant effect. Okay, and this is important why, because somehow it gives credence to your common trade assumption. What it also tells you is that actually your treatment variable is unlikely to be correlated with past, and I insist on past, uh, unobserved firm country year sharps. Okay, so with a very simple, uh, um, with a very simple graph, very simple test, what you can see is that actually, okay, maybe there is a correlation between the error term and the treatment variable, but uh, uh, the treatment variable is unlikely to be correlated with past values of uh, the error term. Okay, very simply with the placebo test. Then what I do in the second test is that actually I conduct an IV. Okay, and I don't do anything new here. Okay, so basically what I do is that I borrow a strat the identification strategy of Mion and Opromala and Mion and Quarters, um, which are other papers in the uh, literature that look basically uh, at the effect of uh, manager experience on firm exports, not FDI, but exports. And what they do actually is that the instrument, the stock of experienced uh, managers using the three-year lag value of the stock of experienced managers. Okay, so they, do, ju they just use the lag. So of course you have to, I mean, to believe in this uh, estimation, you have to make some assumptions. Okay, so uh, in my case, if I transpose this hypothesis, I have to assume that appointments have no direct effect on FDIs after three years. Is it a credible assumption? I don't know. I mean, this is something that can be debated and this is not clear for sure. But if you believe in this identification strategy, if you believe in this hypothesis, actually I found that the instrument has very, I mean, has a lot of power in the first stage, okay? And uh, actually the second search results are very much in line with the uh, previous ones. So if you believe in this assumption, okay, the correlation between the treatment variable and uh, the error term should not drive the results, okay? So here with this simple placebo test and naive variable, I've shown that Okay, the treatment variable could be correlated with the error term, but not with bad value of the error term. Okay, and under some assumptions um, that are clearly ad hoc somehow, um, this correlation should not drive the results. So this is very, I mean, very simple test, 
But I think that, um, I mean, yeah, you have to make this very big assumption. Huh? Uh, appointments have no effect after three years, which can be debated. Uh, and I think that somehow we can try to do better. And this is what I tried to do in the two other tests um, that I will explain by that. Okay, so in the third test, what I do is that I use what I call unexpected movement of executive. So the rational is the following. Um, so in general, so as I was saying, firms um, uh, take the time to choose very strategically an executive. Okay, so I don't know if they, maybe they want to reach new markets, they, I mean, they take the time to, 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 yeah, to choose their, their executive, but sometimes they don't have the choice to do so. Okay, so sometimes they have to rush or, uh, uh, or uh, they have to replace an executive against their will. Okay. So sometimes executives move across firms, not due to the firm, but because of some events, for example, death, et cetera, or um, uh, due to movements, I mean, that are uh, precipitated by the executive themselves. So the assumption that I do in this exercise that I assume that changes in the treatment variable are exogenous and they are not correlated with the error term if, um, the, these changes are due to movements related to resignations, requirements, death, uh, uh, legal inv investigations, etc. Okay, and I'm just assuming that under such circumstances, endogeneity is way less less plausible. Okay. So what I do is that I, yeah, I go through a lot of documents online on your SEC, FBI reports, a lot of uh, press releases, newspapers, etc., to see, I mean, to see what are the reasons for the movement of executive or cross firms, okay? And uh, basically, yeah, when I adopt this strategy, actually, I end up with very similar results, okay? So the coefficient is at the same order of magnitude and the coefficient is still statistically significant, okay? So using this strategy, I mean, give credence to uh, the management results that I presented you at the beginning of the paper. Then finally, what I do, uh, a complementary approach is uh, that I exploit a quasi natural experiment, okay? So in the literature, I mean, there have been some papers showing that policy uncertainty reduces trade, investments, and FDI, okay? And you have also some papers showing that a very specific event, that is the granting of what we call the permanent normal trade relation status uh, by the US to China in late 2000, substantially reduced this uh, uh, trade policy uncertainty between the US and China. Okay. And uh, um, a very nice feature of this event actually is that it was like very anticipated. Okay, it came very quickly at the end of uh, a very quick uh, procedure firms were not equally exposed to the shock, okay? And actually the intensity to the shock is given by what we call non-normal trade relation tariff rates set a long time ago in the 1930s. So because they have been set in a long time ago, you can consider that the treatment uh, uh, is uh, exogenous. And uh, uh, finally, there is no pre-existing trends in FDIs of US firms to China before the treatment. Okay, so what I do is that I use this Quasi natural experiment. Okay, and I made two predictions. First, if you believe in the literature, you should observe that firms that were the most exposed to the shock should have invested more in reaction to the shock. Okay, after the reduction in trade policy uncertainty, then firms that were the most exposed should have invested more in response to the shock. This is uh, the prediction you can make if you believe in the literature. Then if you believe in my paper, you should also expect that this reaction was more pronounced, okay, stronger for firms that had managers familiar with China, okay? So basically I, uh, um, uh, I bring these predictions to the data, okay? So I use a triple different estimator, okay? And uh, basically what I do is that to uh, uh, investigate this, I use a subsample of firms for which uh, the number of experienced executives do not change between 1995 and 2005. 
Why? Because I don't, I don't want to, uh, to allow for the possibility that firms invest in China and hire experienced executives in the same time. Okay. And again, uh, uh, basically the results are in line with the predictions. Okay. So all in all, I mean, if you combine these four, uh, uh, these four uh, uh, tests, actually it tells you that the effect is causal and uh, should not be, uh, I mean, the endogeneity should not drive uh, the results. All right. I still yeah. have about two minutes or so to finish. Okay. Up. Okay. So I think I will pass uh, uh, on, on the additional results. Okay. So very quickly. Um, so what I knew this paper is that I built a database on subsidiaries and executives of S&P firms. Okay. Between 1993 and 2014. What I do is that I conduct a, an event study. You know, to uh, estimate the effect of recruiting experienced executives uh, on firms present abroad. Okay. And uh, only know what I found in the paper is that the top executives, they acquire country specific knowledge, okay? And this is something that is valuable on the limo market to help their firms develop internationally, okay? In the countries uh, uh, they are familiar with. And I think yeah, that, yeah, this, uh, this could have very important policy implications in particular when it comes to uh, uh, profit shifting and corporate tax avoidance. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have uh, any question, please don't hesitate. And if you want a more research about that, you can uh, check, I mean, there are the slides, the paper, everything on the, uh, my website. Okay, excellent. So I'm gonna stop